God will direct you. The Bible says, be ye not unwise, but understanding. Understand what the will of the Lord is. If we will seek Him, God will show us how to be blessed. God will break off of us whatever the devil has put on us in Jesus' name. Ask and ye shall receive. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. There's power in us to bring healing and miracles and signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. Nothing shall be impossible to us. Nothing shall be withheld from us because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name. And welcome today to Word Alive. I'm Pastor Bob Rogers. And on today's program, I am believing that four things are going to happen in your life. Number one, during this season, I'm expecting God to release jumbo, triple-sized blessings. I mean uh, things that uh, you've dreamed about, opportunities that can change your future. Secondly, this is a season for God to heal your family. Many of you have been divided. There's been offenses that have never healed. It's time to get those healed. The third miracle is that this is a time of answered prayer. Some of you have planted seeds. You have prayed and prayed. Well, it's harvest time. This is a time that God is going to answer these prayers. And the fourth thing is, this is a season for great wisdom and great uh, answers to problems you've been facing. I felt like God spoke to me that we will have released on us the spirit and wisdom of Solomon. You know, Solomon, one day they brought, uh, these two ladies brought a baby. Each claimed that was their baby. And so he said, well, we're going to cut the baby in half. Give each of you a half of that baby. And the real mother spoke up, said, oh, don't do that. Just give the baby to her. And Solomon says, you're the real mother because you want that baby to live. And the baby was awarded to her. Well, God has wisdom. And God wants to release that wisdom to us that every decision we make will be the right decision. Well, I'm going to be sharing more on today's program. And I know that God is going to do something great for you. So don't go away. And one of the things that we asked, we said we want the embassy moved to Jerusalem. Now, there are 87 countries that recognize Israel and have their embassies there. Not one of them, however, has their embassy in Jerusalem. Now, any other nation, your embassy is always where this, that nation's capital is, but not in Israel. It's in Tel Aviv. And the reason is because of the uproar that comes from the uh, Palestinians in the Muslim countries. And so... In 1995, there was a, a bill that was passed. It was called the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995. And it gave power to the president to move our embassy to Jerusalem. But it also has a clause that as the president, because of political reasons, you can delay that moving for six months. And so every president since that time has delayed our moving of the embassy. It was the Bushes delayed it, the Clintons delayed it, then Bush too delayed it, and President Obama delayed it. Well, Mr. Trump says, I'm not going to delay it. I'm going to move it. And so uh, Senator McConnell told us this. He said the United Nations has come out with a restriction and with a a, an attack upon Israel. And in that attack, they can absolutely bring war criminal charges to Netanyahu for simply establishing settlements on the West Bank. And there was all type of restrictions, and America has asked that those restrictions be removed. And uh, Mr. McConnell said if they're not removed, then our recommendation to the president is to move the embassy in May. Now, May is that six-month period where the president 
needs to make a decision or it's delayed for another six months. And so the UN has laughed in the face of the United States. The United States has drawn a line in the dust and probably in the month of May, there will be an announcement that America is going to move the embassy. Are you following and you're hearing what I'm saying? Now when that happens, all hell's going to break loose with the Palestinians. One of the things that could happen is they've come and they've threatened us with our television station when there was something else that took place a couple of months ago that they were going to close us down. Well, they didn't close us down. We're preaching the gospel. We're the number one station over there amongst the Palestinians. But if they did close us down, uh, we would go to the American government and we would say because of what has happened, we feel that you need to work things out where we can open our station again, only this time in Jerusalem. And that would be a whole lot better. Somebody say amen. But whatever happens, it's going to work out for our good. But I want to share something with you now by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When that happens, when we move the embassy, there are a number of things that are going to happen. Number one, there is going to be unprecedented prosperity for the United States. God said he would bless those that bless Israel. And no country has taken a step of blessing and recognition before like this. And so I believe that it's going to be a time that our stock market soars, our property values increase, the economy just begins to move forward in an unprecedented way here in America. But secondly, and most important, it's going to spark a revival, a real move of the Holy Ghost. And where you read these, re, these uh, religiosity people who tell us that Christianity is through in the Middle East, that's all a bunch of baloney. A revival is going to be released in Israel. That which was prophesied by Paul in the book of Romans is going to take place. A move of God is going to be released here in the United States. You're going to see a new wave of the Holy Ghost and a move of God is going to take place throughout Great Britain and in Ireland and in Scotland and in England. And I want to tell you exactly why. When we talk about uh, Ireland and when you talk about the people of Israel, there's connection. And back in the 8th century, uh, there was some awesome things that were taking place. Uh, the world power in those days was the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were out of the country of uh, Iraq. Actually, Mosul was uh, ancient Nineveh. And just as you have seen the atrocities and the murders and the killings ISIS has done there, that's that spirit that is so violent. Uh, the Assyrians were perhaps the most violent army in the history of mankind, even worse than ISIS. They have some of the friezes of the Assyrian army in the British Museum. I've been there to the British Museum. I've seen some of these. And one of the things they developed back in the 8th century before Christ was a flying machine. They made this contraption and they harnessed these eagles. And a, a, a boy probably 8 to 10 years of age, very, very lightweight, was harnessed in a little box. And they had a carrot stick. And these eagles would fly. And they were able to fly and he could direct them and they would do reconnaissance for their armies. They would tell the movement of the troops. And then when they captured people, the torture was beyond anything you could imagine. Many times they would peel the skin off of them. They would, they would cannibalize them. They would crucify them. And it was so bad that it sent fear all through the world and especially in Israel because they were hundreds and hundreds of miles from Jerusalem but it was only a matter of time before they would come and conquer uh, conquer Israel so the 
Jewish people fled by the hundreds of thousands. I'm not talking about uh, eight or 10,000 people. I'm talking about entire cities were vacated. And they immigrated and they migrated into parts of Europe. And so when you look of France and Germany and Spain, many of the foundation pieces that helped make those countries become great were really the Hebrews, the Israelites, and their stability of law and their stability of their faith in God. Well, during this time, there were the Phoenicians. And if you are familiar with your Bible, Jesus talked about Tyre. Tyre was the Phoenicians. They developed an alphabet which was identical to the Hebrew language. The fact is, if you talk Phoenician, you could talk Hebrew. And, and uh, it was just a, a brother-sister relationship between those people. And during the times of Solomon, the head of the, uh, uh, the Tyre, the king of Tyre, he joined his navy with the Hebrews. Now, listen, I'm not giving you a history lesson. I, I'm, I'm sharing with you how this move of God's taking place. And so they joined forces and there were more, there were 10 times more Jews than there were these Phoenicians. And they sailed. They sailed to America. They sailed around the world. And they sailed and set colonies in Ireland and in Great Britain. And so many times when you read, well, those were Phoenicians, they weren't the Phoenicians. They were the Jews. And so their ships took many of these people that were trying to get away from the Assyrians and they settled in Ireland. And so there they set up their religious worships. And when you read about Stonehenge and you read about <clears throat> these groves of worship and these way these stones and who could have been these pagan people that set, it was the Jews. And they set them up similar to the altars that you read about in Exodus and in where Abraham set up groves and where Moses set up the rocks and pillars of 12, and almost all of these places, there are 12 pillars that are set up in their form of worship. And it was, it was Judaism, and even though it, it became uh, polluted by other ways of believing, it still was the base of, of, of Judaism. And so when you look at the Celtic language, it is related there to, to Hebrew. It's all related together. And when you take the blood and you take the DNA of many of the Irish people, it can go back to you got a little bit of Jew blood in you. You got a little bit of Hebrew in you. Are y'all following what I, I'm, I'm saying? And so when, when Joseph of Arimathea Say, raise your right hand. Say, I like this guy. I like Joseph of Arimathea. Here's what the Bible says. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. He was a wealthy guy. He came down and he took the body of Jesus. Remember that story? And he buried him in his tomb. Well, what happened was when that, when that took place, they came to torture him and persecute him. And he left the country and he ended up going to Great Britain. There was already this, uh, this transportation, there was already this railroad connection because there had been hundreds of thousands of Jews that had gone on before, and he ends up being the first Christian missionary to ever go to England. And the fact is, he settled, settled up in Glastonbury, and when he was buried, he was buried and everyone knew Joseph of Arimathea is buried there. So when King Arthur died, King Arthur is buried there in the same cemetery of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph gave his, his uh, tomb to a, a, the king of kings. And now all the little kings want to be buried where Joseph is buried. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Now I say all of this because... I'm building up. Come on, I'm, I'm landing this plane here in just a minute, but I, I want you to follow me. I'm on course. So now comes the Babylonians. 
the Babylonians are getting ready to take Jerusalem in 586 uh, B.C. And the prophet in the land was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a white-headed prophet. He had an assistant by the name of Barak. He was his scribe. He did all the writing. Jeremiah never married. He knew the king. They, uh, and he began to prophesy that no, no use fighting Nebuchadnezzar. He's come here. He's going to punish us. And you need to flee. Well, they took Jeremiah and they threw him in the miry clay. They left him to die and the people helped deliver him. But now this is where it gets a little into the legend. And I want to share this. I had a professor in seminary who wrote the textbook, Jeremiah. It was used by most seminaries in America. And he was my professor. And I had to read that book of Jeremiah once a week. I read the whole thing once a week. I got so tired of reading Jeremiah, I could just throw up, let's be honest with you. But at the end of the day, it was believed that Jeremiah, he fled Jerusalem, and he fled to Ireland. And he took with him, perhaps, the Ark of the Covenant, because the Ark of the Covenant was never found when Nebuchadnezzar came in and took Jerusalem. He also took a harp. He took with him the king's daughter, so a seed of David would be preserved. And he fled, and when you read early Celtic history, it talks about this white-headed man coming with his servant Barak and a princess from another land. And we believe, and history kind of comes together, that he probably went to Ireland. Now, that's not all he took. He took with him what was called Jacob's Stone, which in England they call it the Stone of Destiny. Now, let me just say about Jacob's Stone. Many of you know the story about Jacob, how he fled for his life. And he fled to a place, and he made a rock, a pillow, and he has this dream. This ladder goes to heaven. These angels go up and down this ladder. And he come, wakes up and he says, truly, this is the house of God. And he calls it Bethel, meaning the house of God. And so then he flees for his life to Syria. When he comes back 20 years later and he makes peace with his brother Esau, he said, I have to go back where God and I made a covenant. And he goes back to Bethel. Now this is where the story gets a little gray, but tradition says he took with him that stone. And so when eventually the Jews went down into Egypt, they said he took that stone with him down to Egypt. It stayed there for 400 years. When they left, they took the stone with them. Moses took it with him. And then when Moses smote the stone and the water came out of the stone, Tradition says it came out of that stone, the stone of Jacob. And then the kings that were knighted, they were knighted on that stone. They were blessed on that stone. They would kneel on that stone. Well, well Jacob or, or Jeremiah, tradition says he took that stone with him and he took it to Ireland. And in Ireland, their kings were knighted on that stone. Later, the Scots came over. They defeated the Irish, and they took that stone to Scotland. And then the English defeated the Scots, and they took it to London. And it, that stone is a famous stone in England. It's called the Stone of Destiny. And so what happened, they had it in the St. Uh, 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 Westminster Abbey Church. That's the church of the Anglicans. And it was down in the basement, and these kids broke into the church. They were college students from Scotland. And uh, many of you read that story. They stole the stone, the stone of destiny that was supposedly Jacob's stone. They, they stole it, and when it was discovered that it was missing, the Scotland Yard, the FBI, everybody in the world was looking for that stone, and so they made a deal with the lawyer that they could get off if they turned the stone back, 
but in their hurry, they dropped the stone and broke it. And so the, the Scots rose up and they finally took that stone and they put it in a castle in Edinburgh and I have gone to that stone. I've looked at the stone. It's in Edinburgh today. It's called the Stone of Destiny. And all of that's on it. This is the stone that Jacob uh, put his head on and on and on and on. Now I say all that. If you can believe it, good. If you can't believe it, but there's some kind of truth in this. But the Irish and the Scots and the English were all affected by Israel. Their seed went there. And when it says all Israel shall be saved, it's talking about not only in Jerusalem, but in these other areas where there was such prominence and such an influence of the Jewish people. And there's revival coming to Ireland. A great move of God, and I'm here to say, now is the time for the move of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you come from countries where Islam was very, very prevalent. And I'm going to tell you, Islam is so demonic, it's so evil. It's not a peaceful religion. There are many people that I have met that were Islamic, that were as nice, nice people. They weren't radical. But the true faith of Islam is let's kill Christians and Jews. That's what it is. And, but you cannot hate Muslim people and see Muslim people get saved. You can't hate members of your family and see those people get saved. You can hate them, but you won't see them get born again. There's got to be a love and for there to be a revival amongst the Islamic people, there's got to be a love towards the people. I pray against that religion and against the terrorists but I pray for God to send a revival to the Muslim people. And I'm here to tell you that revival is beginning to come in waves that's not published. The Muslims aren't going to publish this, but there is a move of God that is taking place. Now, a number of years ago, we went into Iraq. And uh, the church here, they uh, gave money for Bibles. And we well, I hope you enjoyed today's program. I want to share in just uh, a few days, I'm going to be leaving for the country of Ireland. We'll be in Dublin, and there we have 26 different churches that are joining together for a crusade. We have rented the largest uh, auditorium in that region, and in that region, there is a evil phenomena that's taken place. It rates one of the highest suicide places in the world. The fact is, it's the destination for suicides. People come from all over Ireland. They come from Europe. And they'll come to this one particular city where our auditorium is. And there they kill themselves. It's evil. It's wicked. And yet in the midst of this darkness, God's spoken to us to go. And I'm asking as many as can to help us to go to Ireland. I figure it's going to cost us a little over $25,000 to rent the auditorium and to uh, fulfill this uh, crusade. But as many as could help us with a gift of $58, I have something that I want to send to you that will be a great blessing. Number one, I want to send to you a book entitled 100 Days of Unbroken Prayer. And then the book entitled America Fasting for Revival, and the CD, Unlocking the Supernatural. These three amazing uh, words from God. And I'm asking you, when you uh, send that gift, that you enter into covenant with me for entering into 100 days of unbroken prayer. Now that unbroken prayer will take you all the way to almost July the 4th. But it will be a time that God will change your life. And I share in this book, 100 Days of Unbroken Prayer, how and how to do that and what begins to happen spiritually in your own life. Now, since uh, October, I have uh, prayed at the same time for almost six months. 
I haven't missed a day. And when I began to do that, a miracle began to happen. I've always prayed. I've read my Bible. Haven't missed one day of reading the Bible in over 30 years. But praying at the same time releases certain miracles that you cannot explain. I don't have an answer to this, but it's just like a new anointing. I want to send this to you, and I'm asking you to send your most generous gift, but those who can send a gift of $58, I want to send these two uh, books and this CD that I know will bless you. It goes to help reach the country of Ireland. God's sending a revival and stirring something big there. Many of you have Irish roots. My wife it was a Murphy, so she has to be from Ireland. But it's going to be a great, uh, a great revival. I'll be giving you updates what's taking place. The information where you can send that is right there on the screen. Uh, BobRogersMinistries.org, or you can call that number, and I appreciate whatever you can do. Our time's gone, and I invite you to stop with me now as we, as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke every evil, wicked attack of the enemy. I release, Lord, miracles that heal families. I release answers to prayer, prayers that have been prayed for a long, long time, seeds that have been planted. Father, this is harvest time. Thirdly, Lord, I pray for supernatural wisdom, wisdom that can only come from you, answers to, to problems and to riddles in our life that only you can solve. Fourthly, Lord, I pray for extra big, large blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you next week at the same time. Call now and get Dr. Bob Rogers' new package on a lifestyle of fasting and prayer for your gift of $58. It includes his best-selling book, America, Fasting for Revival, and... 100 Days of Unbroken Prayer. Contact us today and we'll include the teaching on CD, Unlocking the Supernatural. Call now, 1-888-613-6080 or visit bobrogersministries.org. And thanks for your continued support. Join Dr. Bob Rogers on Facebook Live Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern Standard. Start your day the right way at facebook.com slash Dr. Bob Rogers. Today, in the name of Jesus, I'm believing that God is going to do something mighty in the name of the Lord. I believe God's going to heal. I believe God's going to set free. God's going to do things that have never happened before in your life. God can break the poor off of you. Put the blessing on you in the name of Jesus Christ. Because we are walking uprightly before the Lord. I break generational curses. I break it in the name of Jesus Christ. May there be a change that takes place for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name.